Hello and welcome everybody to this online live debate organised by the Stop Climate Chaos Coalition and part of their Africa Connect uh, organisation. Uh, I am Damien Carrington, I'm Head of Environment at The Guardian and I am in London. With me in the studio here, uh, I'm delighted to say we've got the UK Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, Chris Hume, uh, who will be representing the UK in Durban next week. Uh, here also in London, I have Hannah Stoddart from Oxfam, and live in Durban, we have Tasneem Essop from WWF. So uh, the way we'll run this uh, live debate is that I'm going to give each of the people on the panel um, a couple of minutes to um, set out their uh, position. I'll start with Hannah, uh, then go to Chris, and then to Tasneem. Um, afterwards, we'll get straight into your questions, uh, some of which you've already uh, submitted uh, but you can also submit them now, and I'll be getting them and asking them live. You can do that through the form on the site, um, or you can do it through Twitter using the hashtag hash Hume Connect. So that's H-U-H-N-E Connect. Okay, so uh, let's get started. If we can start with uh, Hannah, can you um, tell us what is it you'd like to get out of Durban? Sure, thank you. Firstly, I'd just like to say thank you for being invited onto the panel tonight on behalf of Oxfam GB. Um, now, there are a number of things that Oxfam is looking for from Durban. Firstly, of course, we would like to see a second commitment period for the Kyoto Protocol. Secondly, alongside that, we would like a signal from all countries, in addition to the Kyoto Protocol countries, that they will be willing in the future to sign a legally binding agreement. Thirdly, we'd like an increase in ambition regarding targets for carbon emission reductions that will see Durban set us on a pathway for emissions to reduce by 2020 below business as usual projections. And lastly, we would like to see the global climate finance architecture get set up and get funds rolling into that architecture as well. And I'd just like to outline a few points specifically in relation to climate finance. Firstly, the Green Climate Fund. We'd like to see that get up and running in Durban. We'd like to see that agreed. Um, secondly, in order to get funds flowing into that, that Green Climate Fund, we'd like countries, including the UK, to indicate that they're going to be prepared to make pledges to that fund by next year and we very much welcome the Secretary of State's recent uh, public commitment to put substantial climate finance into that fund if the rules are right for that fund. And then in, in addition to that, as well as pledges, we'd like to see some progress on innovative sources of finance. So that's so that we might meet that 100 billion a year by 2020, that was pledged by governments and countries in, in Copenhagen a few years ago. We need to see other mechanisms for raising that finance. Now, there are many things on the table, and I'd just like to mention one, and that is a, um, a carbon price on shipping that Oxfam and WWF are calling for. We think, given that the uh, shipping contributes uh, a significant amount of emissions, we think that a carbon price on shipping would contribute to hopefully lowering those emissions, as well as raising substantial finance um, for climate change that could be directed into the Green Climate Fund. And we really think that could be a strong win out of Durban, and we'd really encourage the Secretary of State um, to take leadership on, on that from the UK's perspective. Thank okay. you. Okay, thanks very much, Hannah. So, Chris, there's Oxfam shopping list. What will you be pushing for next week when you go to Durban? Uh, well, I've got a very similar shopping list. Um, I, I think that we first of all got to just remember what the key problem is that we're trying to resolve. First crucial thing is that all of the participants have to be guided by the science. Uh, and the science is becoming more alarming, not less, uh, more clear. Um, some of the science, for example, around uh, whether or not we have global warming, which was commissioned uh, after the so-called climate gate email leak at, uh, before Copenhagen by climate change skeptics has now come back and shows very clearly uh, that the original research results were right uh, and that we therefore really have to deal with this problem urgently. And we think that it is crucial uh, that we live up to what was agreed at Cancun in respecting the science. That means that we have to get global carbon emissions down and down by 2020, 
and that means even if we have a really good run at ratifying uh, the treaty uh, that uh, results, we need to get things agreed by 2015. So that's the position that we're going to Durban with. We want a legally binding agreement uh, for the same reasons uh, that uh, Oxfam has quite rightly set out. No global problem up until now has ever been resolved satisfactorily without a really key legally binding agreement. That's arguably not enough, but it's essential. Uh, the commitments have to be strong, they have to be credible, uh, and we're not going to get commitments to be strong and credible unless there's a legally binding agreement. Now, beyond that, um, there are absolutely key uh, elements such as, for example, making sure that the framework we've already made progress on uh, makes more progress on measurement, reporting, verification. If we can't trust each other to deal with the same units in terms of cutting emissions, curbing emissions, carbon intensity and so forth, uh, then it's not going to hang together. So measurement, reporting and verification is absolutely crucial and the parallels are there, for example, with uh, disarmament talks and so forth. It's absolutely crucial that we are, are confident on that. How about uh, the finance? Are you hoping to push forward? Uh, well, I'm going to get to the finance in just one minute, but I think that there are some other points as well. I think we can make some real progress also on deforestation. I hope that that element is going to be there. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, on mitigation, uh, making sure that we are beginning to think through uh, the consequences of what the scientific advice is, and particularly the UNEP's latest report on the emissions gap makes it very clear that we need to live up to uh, what the science is saying, and we're not there yet. The pledges, uh, the Copenhagen pledges, are not enough in order to deliver. And finally, of course, it is crucial uh, if we're going to have a fair and balanced package. Obviously, it means that different countries take different levels of responsibility, common but differentiated responsibility depending on their level of development. That's understood. But it does mean that we have to actually have a clear uh, framework which is not based uh, on what the status of different countries was back in 1992, but on what their status is today. 1992 uh, being when the Kyoto Protocol was first and and, and when uh, you know, it was set in stone that there would be countries that were regarded as developing and countries that were regarded as developed. And we have some developing countries regarded as developing in terms of the treaty, which, uh, for example, like Singapore, are richer than every European country except one. And we have some European countries, like Bulgaria and Romania, who are transition countries, uh, that are members of the European Union, but are actually many countries in Latin America and in Asia. So we've got to update the framework, and yes, there has to be common but differentiated responsibilities, but it has to be genuinely based on the world as it is today, and not on some imaginary world as it was in 1992. And on that basis, the countries that are in most peril, the ones that are threatened by sea level rise, the small island states, the estuary delta cultures, the Bangladeshis, the Vietnams, those sort of countries need particular help with adaptation. Uh, and, of course, that is where the climate finance comes in. And climate finance is absolutely crucial. Fast start finance. Uh, we in the UK have lived up to our Copenhagen and our Cancun commitments in supporting uh, developing countries with uh, uh, fight climate change and uh, we're going to meet our fast start pledge to deliver 1.5 billion international climate finance by 2012. Uh, in addition, of course, there's the Green Climate Fund and we welcome the work of the Transitional Committee to design the Green Climate Fund. We think that should be the basis of the final uh, document. Uh, it's a good design document. It includes many positive and balanced elements uh, and we hope that that will be the basis of uh, of a real consensus and we're committed with other developed countries to jointly mobilize the hundred billion dollars a year for climate finance for developing countries and at Durban we want to see greater progress on that long-term finance so that developed countries uh, can play their part in helping developing countries move uh, forwards and of course I'm very proud of the fact that the UK uh, will be the first major uh, developed economy uh, to meet the 0.7% of GDP uh, aid target uh, 
set out many, many years ago by the United Nations, uh, and that's a testimony to how important we think the uh, role of development is and the role also, of course, of dealing with these absolutely existential threats for many developing countries uh, to their future and to their development. Okay, well, thank you very much, Chris. Um, again, Chris has set out his uh, agenda very clearly. I want to bring in uh, Tasneem in Durban. Tasneem, can you, can you tell us what's been happening so far? The, negoci the negotiations started on uh, Monday, I think. Well, good evening here from Durban. It's a wet Durban, this side as well. I believe it's wet, that side. Um, we are having lots of interesting developments happening in Durban, both inside and outside of the negotiation process. Uh, of course, inside the negotiation process, we've seen a lot of um, uncertainty actually about what the outcomes eventually could look like. Uh, we do know that the two big issues on this agenda is clarity about the legal form. And so we certainly need to look at what will happen in terms of um, what we call saving the Kyoto and we would obviously look at what developing countries are willing to put on the table. And then linked to that is, of course, the big issue of finance. And given that this is an African COP, this is a big issue for this agenda. And so what we are finding right now are some interesting developments and unexpected developments, certainly around the Green Climate Fund. Yesterday, when the report was tabled by the Transitional Committee chairs, uh, we found that parties had, in fact, opened up the discussion, discussion about the report Port. And so there's a risk of us having long negotiations about that fund. And so we are really worried that that might not be agreed to in Durban. So certainly some dramatic changes happening here in the talks itself. And at the same time, outside, civil society has been mobilizing quite strongly around the Kyoto Protocol, uh, calling for a, commitment to, a second, uh, uh, commitment to the second commitment period for that protocol, and, of course, also calling very specifically for finance to flow. Lots of activities happening around Durban, and so we are um, having interesting times and looking forward to, I'm sure, more dramatic and interesting times going forward. We certainly are looking forward to uh, welcoming the Secretary of State to Durban. I believe you'll be coming to Durban on Monday, and so we look forward to you um, coming to, to South Africa. Thank you very much indeed. Right, we're going to get straight on with uh, your questions. As I say, you can uh, submit them on screen or through Twitter using the hashtag uh, HumeConnect. Um, we're going to get through as many as we can. We won't be able to answer every single one, but um, let me start with one that was submitted just a little bit earlier by uh, someone called Rod, uh, which says, are you going to commit the UK government and influence the EU to commit to continuing binding targets on reducing CO2 emissions under an extension of the Kyoto Protocol, which I think gets to one of the key issues which um, was mentioned there, which is what is the fate of Kyoto? Should, it, should there be a second period? Should it be recast to take in other people? What, 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 what position will you be taking, Chris? Well, Rob, the key uh, for us is that Kyoto was the first legally binding uh, instrument to deal with this problem, and as a result, it's a key building block for the future. We want to see a second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol. We want to see everybody in an ideal world join up uh, in the Kyoto Protocol and take on uh, real uh, obligations which will tackle this problem. Uh, since the first uh, Kyoto Protocol uh, commitment period, however, we have seen a number of countries, Russia, Japan, uh, Canada, uh, say that they're not going to sign up uh, to a second commitment period. Uh, we've also seen Australia, uh, New Zealand uh, having worries about it. Uh, if uh, we were to extend the second commitment period without getting commitments to that legally binding overarching framework for everybody, then effectively what we would be left with is a Kyoto Protocol covering Europe, which is about 12% of global emissions, so that would leave 88% uh, of global emissions outside uh, the framework of the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, and to our mind, that simply isn't good enough. So we're saying very clearly we want the Kyoto Protocol, we want to make sure that there is a second commitment period, but we also have to have a commitment from everybody, including some of the big developing countries that are now enormous emitters, 
Look at China, the biggest emitter in the world, and now with emissions per head, which are higher than some of the southern European countries like France and Italy. Uh, we have to have real assurance that there is going to be uh, a framework to cover everyone. And that's the basis on which we're going into Durban. We want to see a proper legally binding framework for everyone. We want to see a second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, Tasneem, I might come to you. You're there in uh, Durban at the moment. And um, Chris has stated very clearly that he wants all countries to take on some commitment in, in a second uh, period of the Kyoto Protocol. I mean, how, how's that being discussed at the moment in Durban? Well, there's very differing views on the part of uh, the different parties and specifically, of course, between developed and developing countries. Certainly, for developing countries, they would like to get a much stronger signal around the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol. Um, there's not been, we understand that the EU is the only powerful bloc actually now looking to consider taking that second commitment period as the Secretary of State indicated. But the developing countries are really concerned that there's be slippage around the level of responsibility and leadership that developed countries need to very clearly state and indicate in Durban. On the other hand, we've also seen some flexibility and some movement on the part of some of the key developing countries. My country, South Africa, has made it very clear that they are willing to take on legally binding commitments and they're willing to look at reaching an agreement on a mandate to negotiate such a legally binding outcome um, in the future. And certainly we've been seeing and hearing about shifts in amongst other uh, of these key countries. And so what we're finding right now is that many of these discussions are happening. Uh, it's still very fluid. I believe what we need to encourage is closer cooperation between the EU and uh, the G77 plus, plus China, but specifically also an opening up, and I know this is happening already, of discussions between the EU and the basics uh, specifically. I, I think that is a critical thing. These parties need to find each other. Uh, the EU and the basics, if they could reach some kind of agreement uh, around how to frame this uh, uh, um, commitment that could be made and what is required in terms of uh, the EU from these developing countries, we will find uh, that it, that could create the momentum for the buy-in from other developing countries uh, that might not want this. I'll get to a second question which comes from uh, Anne Hillier uh, which is to do with the, um, the, the Green Climate Fund. Um, I mean, one thing I'm going to sort of add to Anne's question is that there was obviously a rather a, um, a, a surprise with uh, the USA and Saudi Arabia uh, deciding not to go forward with that. Um, so I'd be interested in your response to that, Chris, but also uh, Anne asked specifically, um, how will you ensure that uh, the Green Fund is used to promote only non-polluting power sources for developing countries and also without putting them into further debt? Well, the two, two points. I mean, first of all, uh, the US and Saudi Arabia positions at this stage of the game, uh, it seems to me uh, very uh, likely that those positions are being uh, staked out uh, to make sure that when we come to the final negotiations, they've got something that they are uh, able to trade. So I wouldn't take... Uh, uh, those things as being too serious. I think what they do suggest to me uh, is that the Saudis and the uh, Americans believe that things may be moving on other areas uh, and that they're trying to preserve some uh, firepower for the trading that's going to happen at the end of the negotiations. Uh, but our position uh, in the European Union and in the UK is very clear. We think that the proposals for the Green Climate Fund that uh, came out uh, of the uh, Transitional Committee were good ones. We don't want to undo any of them. We, we think that's a good basis uh, for an agreement uh, and therefore we'll be very much fighting to see that they're part of the final conclusions. Uh, it's inevitable that the very substantial burden on the second part of Anne's question was wh what uh, would we expect to see to ensure uh, the Green Climate Fund isn't going to be doing anything that's ungreen, apart from obviously the fact that its title is pretty clear. Remember, I think that the, one of the key things that 
developing countries need in terms of finance uh, is particularly for adaptation. Mitigation finance, in other words, for example, helping to decarbonize the power sector, you can do often with private sector capital, which is what we're doing, for example, in the United Kingdom and many other countries, by setting the right framework through regulation, through incentives, you can get private capital to do it. Where it's really essential uh, that there is funding uh, through governments and through aid is for adaptation measures where you really can't get the private sector as easily to fund things like, for example, flood defences, uh, some of the basic things that are needed. Uh, if you're in a delta culture or if you're in a low-lying uh, uh, island state, uh, you need to protect yourself against some of the consequent, the dangerous consequences of climate uh, change. So I think it's very clear that the Green Climate Fund is going to have uh, a focus uh, on the uh, importance of funding for of that sort of activity. And the question of debt, in, in terms of you know potentially putting uh, these poor countries into further debt, well, how, the, how key, that be the, the key thing on debt is to make sure, obviously, that if there is any new debt, I'm not against. Uh, potentially uh, loan funding per se, because loan funding, after all, if it's there to create an asset which is going to earn a return, and if the return is higher than the payments on the loan, then that's a good deal. And we all do it uh, in the developed world. If you buy your own home, get a mortgage, you, you get a, an ongoing return in terms of the home that you're living in. Uh, so in the loan finance per se, is not a bad thing, but obviously what we mustn't do uh, is dress up uh, finance which is a, needed for, for example, adaptation of measures, take flood defences. Uh, flood defences don't have a return, uh, and therefore there is an issue of whether it would be appropriate to fund uh, that sort of uh, activity through loans. But as part of a balanced package where you have some private finance, some publicly generated loan finance, some multilateral development bank finance, and grant aid, which is very crucial, which is one of the reasons we're increasing in the UK uh, to meet that 0.7% aid target. There is a mix, and we shouldn't be too ideological uh, about uh, okay. saying no to any particular type. Thank you. I am going to bring in Hannah from Oxfam uh, on, on that front. Does that sound like a good position for, for, for our Secretary of State to take to Durban? Well, I, I, think, I think there are aspects of that that Oxfam would agree with. Um, around the loans for adaptation, uh, Oxfam would very strongly say that it's completely inappropriate for, um, for finance for adaptation for developing countries to come in the form of loans, given that this should, to a certain extent, be com compensatory payments. So we'd be quite clear on that. We're also going so far as to say that the finance for the Green Climate Fund should be 50% adaptation, 50% mitigation. We think it's important to, to state that clearly, given that adaptation will be a major priority for some of the most vulnerable and least developed countries. And now coming to this issue of kind of horse trading that we talked about, some of the opposition that is being shown in the, um, in the discussions around the, the Green Climate Fund may well not really be about, about the Green Climate Fund, as we know it may be in relation right. to other aspects of the negotiations. Okay, um, that much is clear. But what I would emphasise is that when you're horse trading around the Green Climate Fund, you're horse trading with people's lives, um, getting money into that fund is absolutely crucial for some of the most vulnerable people who are going to be suffering the impacts of climate change severely in the coming years. Now getting money into that fund to help build their resilience, to, to provide not loans but, but grants to build the kind of infrastructure, the kind of knowledge that we need to adapt to climate change in, in the most vulnerable developing countries is absolutely critical and to, okay. and to delay that through horse trading around the Green Climate Fund would, in, from Oxfam's point of view, not be acceptable. Okay, um, I'm just going to mention one thing, which is in the autumn, autumn statement which the Chancellor made yesterday. He actually reduced the amount of funding going in overseas aid as a result of the, the economy as a whole shrinking, enabling you to meet that 0.7%. I mean, do you think that was the right thing to do? I think it's inevitable that uh, you know, we've got a very ambitious target for aid that has never been met ever before by a major industrial country. And if we shrink uh, our income 
then it is inevitable that the 0.7% as an absolute amount of money is going to shrink. Okay. So I think that was the right uh, decision, uh, but don't forget how ambitious an objective it is, and I'm going to be very, very proud to be a member of a government that delivers it. Great. We'll go to another question. I'm afraid I haven't. Uh, this, is, this one's just come in. I haven't got the name. I'm afraid, but it says um, it's addressed to Chris Hune. Are you in support of tax on international shipping and aviation emissions, particularly as they could both reduce emissions and raise up to thirty billion dollars a year? Well, the answer is very clearly yes. I mean, I was privileged to participate in the UN Secretary General's advisory group on finance, which put forward uh, both of these ideas as an important way of trying to raise finance uh, on that 100 billion uh, commitment to um, finance for the developing countries. And I still think uh, that it is uh, one of the uh, least controversial ways of doing so. Um, th there will be other means as well. There have been discussions around financial transaction tax and so forth. Uh, but if you look at all of the other uh, likely runners uh, there isn't really anything else uh, in the view of the AGF uh, group that reported to Ban Ki-moon uh, which really cuts the mustard in terms of delivering on the sort of scale of finance that we need for the developing world if we don't look at things like bunker fuels uh, and uh, aviation. And so that is the right way what's, forward. What's your feeling for other nations in terms of their attitude to that, those, those taxes on bunker fuels? Well, some of them uh, are concerned about this. Um, uh, clearly, uh, this is a matter of ongoing negotiation. Uh, some are worried about where the money is actually going to be collected from. So clearly, for example, big trading countries uh, uh, are worried that if they use a lot of shipping and aviation, that they're going to pay a particularly high uh, amount, but these are activities which are currently not covered uh, by the international efforts to deal with carbon emissions, and they are both very important emitters. And that's one of the reasons why, in the European Union, for example, we are bringing aviation into the European Union's emissions trading scheme, precisely because it is important that we're confident that we can deal with the overall problem of carbon emissions, including. Uh, emissions from a sector like aviation where some of the evidence is that this is particularly important uh, if we're to tackle climate change. Okay, can, can I just follow up with a question from uh, Chris Dumont that's come through as well, because you mentioned the Robin Hood tax or Tobin tax, however, this, this small tax on uh, financial transactions. Now, the, uh, the UK government has, has kind of said it's a good idea, but they don't want any part of it. I mean, is that the right thing to do? do you no, think? what we're saying is that we're absolutely open to looking at a financial transaction tax if it's a genuinely global tax. Uh, one of the, always one of the problems with taxes of any sort and, any, and wherever you apply them is if you apply a tax and suddenly the people you're applying it to disappear because they can do their business somewhere else and don't pay the tax, then actually you end up with nothing at all. Uh, and uh, we are simply pointing out uh, that if we're going to make a financial transaction tax work, and by the way, or a financial activities tax, or any of the forms uh, that have been suggested, uh, then it is important that it's done on a global basis so you don't get distortions. We actually, as a government, have legislated for a banking levy. So we're actually raising more money from the financial sector, partly in recognition of the fact that financial sectors in many countries pay less tax than the rest of the economy. Our financial sector in Europe, for example, is not subject to value-added tax. You're not uh, saying the bank levy is going to go towards climate change funds? No, but, the, okay. but, but, I, but I am saying that this is potentially globally an yeah. appropriate source of finance, and, okay. and that's one that we can, we can work with, but it does have to be global. Okay. You can't have a situation where only Europe is applying it, and therefore all foreign exchange trading goes to New York. I mean, that wouldn't raise any money at all uh, except okay. it would lose a lot of jobs in Europe. Okay, you made that point. I want to go just briefly, if you don't mind, both to uh, Hannah and Tasneem. Tasneem, in uh, Durban, has there been um, you know, much talk about the bunker taxes or the, uh, the Robin Hood tax so far? Well, yes, certainly just in the overall uh, positioning on finance, uh, the sources of finance is a critical decision that needs to be made in Durban, we believe. And we've seen a growing momentum behind this. We've, 
South Africa, for, South Africa, for example, um, has indicated that they support bunkers. In the past, it's been very difficult uh, to get any certainty out of the South Africans around this position. They seem to have moved. And we are hearing that more and more countries, uh, today we've heard that Bolivia is considering the supporting of bunkers. And so we're finally seeing a growing momentum behind this. And so we'd be very happy if this a Durban conference can come out with a decision on uh, bunkers as a source of finance. The financial... Okay. If you wanted to respond, I mean, does that sound like a good position for the UK to take in on the taxes issues? Well, I mean, Oxfam would just uh, very much encourage the UK to take leadership on this on this carbon price for shipping uh, question that given that obviously the negotiations are relatively fraught we, we do hope that we see progress at Durban on all aspects that I've spoken about tonight and that we've all been that we've all been discussing but I think this this carbon price on shipping is really an area that is not necessarily that controversial that we can get progress on that could potentially raise indeed upwards of 30 billion dollars a year for climate finance um, at a time where it's you know where, where there's a difficult financial climate this could be a real win okay. and you know Oxfam and, and WWF would would praise that win very strongly if it were to happen. Great I want to move on to another question this time from uh, Derek Perdue and it moves on to the issue of forestry and deforestation so Derek asks what resources will the UK contribute to finance uh, in developing countries for their work on reforestation, adaptation, and renewable generation. So, I mean, in, in, in previous conferences, uh, action on deforestation, so-called RED, has been something which seemed like would it had some promise to, you know, for, to, to, for some achievements, and yet it's kind of dragged on a bit. I mean, what are you hoping for this time, Chris? Well, just in, in terms of the specific question about finance, yep. uh, we've uh, earmarked three hundred million pounds as part of our fast start finance specifically for this. Um, we also clearly want to see forests as being a key part of the uh, overall uh, international uh, climate uh, fund. Uh, and forests are absolutely crucial because of their role uh, in uh, stimulating carbon emissions. Essentially, if we were able uh, to uh, curb uh, this, we'd be getting to grips with about 17% of global CO2 emissions. So it's absolutely key. The UK and the European Union aim is to halve gross deforestation by 2020 and halt it altogether by 2030. I've described the, some of the finance which will be available. We're also working with bilateral partners amongst the uh, forest nations to see what the best mechanisms on the ground are to support communities uh, and to try and stop uh, deforestation. And that's work which uh, I think is just absolutely crucial because it's all very well waving uh, large sums of money about, but we've got to also understand the incentives and the needs which are driving that deforestation process, which aren't always the same. They can differ from Brazil, uh, Indonesia, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, and we need to have institutional mechanisms on the ground which actually allow people to develop, prosper, increase their living standards uh, without going through that process of deforestation. And, and how near are those institutional mechanisms? Um, is that um, it's, it's come from Rowena Quantrill, thank you for that, and says that uh, the UK has in the past and also wants in Durban to show uh, some leadership, in particular in persuading countries like China and India to sign a pledge to reduce their emissions. Uh, what effect does um, the statement from the Chancellor, our Finance Minister here in the UK, George Osborne's autumn statement, where uh, in some people's eyes he was rather sceptical about uh, environmental action? So, Chris. Well, uh, I think that's tremendously overblown. I mean, what the Chancellor was saying, uh, and this is a matter which is agreed across the government, is that when uh, companies are particularly uh, reliant on, for example, electricity, and that includes things like aluminium companies where 40% of the costs are electricity. If you load a lot of extra cost into that, you're going to make them uncompetitive, and all that, that happens is that they move somewhere where they don't pay those extra costs. So uh, we've clearly set out a policy where we balance our great ambition on climate change and on carbon emissions with the fact that we're dealing with specific problems which lead to competitive issues.
And if you look at what the government has done domestically uh, since we came in uh, last year, uh, we now have a real track record. Uh, if you look at, for example, setting a fourth carbon budget further ahead than any other country for 2023 to 2027, uh, with real level of domestic ambition, an entirely new way of saving energy in our domestic households with the first Energy Act, uh, which we're now going to be implementing with the launch of the Green Deal scheme uh, in the autumn. Uh, if you look, for example, at our electricity market reform, where we're clearly setting out the framework within which we deliver low carbon electricity generation, fundamental change in the way the UK economy is powered, including, by the way, a carbon price floor that the Chancellor introduced in the budget. All of this, all I ask for is for people to judge the government on its record, judge us by what we do and not by what you think somebody has said. It's an old rule that I used to apply when I was a journalist and I hope Damien will find, uh, I'm sure that he would agree with. But crucially, are we walking the walk? Yes, we are. Do we therefore want to be ambitious and lead uh, on these issues? Yes, we do. And we'll be playing our part in, in, in Durban to say the world has to step up to the plate, has to be ambitious. We owe that to our children and our grandchildren. And we are showing that it can be done, that we can decarbonize a, a major developed economy and we're prepared to take the tough decisions to do so. OK, thanks, Chris. I mean, I think uh, it's certainly true that uh, the climate change legislation is, uh, is, is far ahead of many other places. I mean, there is, a, there is another question which has come up uh, in relation to, you know, the, uh, as you say, what the UK government does. And a lot of people have been asking about um, the uh, story which um, I should say I wrote, um, which was to do with uh, the UK government's uh, involvement with the Canadian government in terms of uh, tar sands policy in Europe. And we've had questions from Brian Woodward, Jonathan Pitt, and uh, a, a lot of others. I mean, um, let me ask one of them specifically, uh, from Brian Woodward. Will the British government, why is the British government supporting the Canadians in their attempts to undermine EU legislation on the development of tar sands as reported uh, by me? Uh, well, I don't recognise that as a description of what's going on. This is a rather techie debate around something called the EU Fuel Quality Directive, which will basically attribute a certain amount of emissions to particular uh, uses of, of fossil fuels. Uh, and we have been saying that if you use fossil fuels that are clearly going to lead to greater greenhouse gas emissions, and that's obviously the uh, Canadian tar sands, but not just the Canadian tar sands, it's also, for example, crude oil uh, from Angola, from Nigeria, or very heavy crudes from Venezuela, then that ought to be taken into a proper account in the accounting system. If you use a light crude, uh, such as, for example, uh, the sort that we produce in the UK and the North Sea, that does produce less uh, carbon emissions for a given uh, tonne uh, that is burned. Uh, and that needs to be taken account of in the accounting mechanism. So there's no question of lining up with the Canadian government on this at all. Uh, and I think we um, have been very clear uh, about our desire to get the Canadian government to renew its commitment to the Kyoto Protocol, to be in there for a second commitment period, uh, and to be part of a legally binding uh, framework. Uh, on this, has it got 34% over their target and they need to be 6% under well, I think the that, end of next year? I think that's absolutely crucial, <laughs> that, and it makes the point that actually signing up for a legally binding agreement is a necessary part of a solution, but it isn't a sufficient one. You also have to have strong and credible commitments domestically and with the change in government that we've seen in Canada, that hasn't happened. And I personally find it, as someone who has had a Canadian mother, uh, I find it very sad that the Canadians who have a long and proud tradition of being in the forefront of many global efforts to deal with problems over many, many years, now find themselves being, uh, instead of in the vanguard, in the caboose, uh, as they say in North America. <laughs> Very good. This brought us on rather nicely, actually, to uh, a question from uh, Melissa. Again, thanks for that. And if you want to get any last questions in now, now's the time to do it. Um, which uh, She talks about how, how would governments uh, who aren't prepared to commit or don't meet targets that are legally binding, how would they be penalised, either, either through the existing Kyoto um, protocol or by future ones? What sort of penalties would, would be appropriate, do you think? 
Uh, it, what, in t for a country, for example, yeah. such as Canada, as you've just been mentioning, which signed up to agreements and then didn't honour them? Yes. Well, there, is, there are uh, systems within the Kyoto Protocol whereby you are committed. Uh, if you aren't able to do things domestically, mm -hmm. you're committed to going out and ensuring that somebody else is doing the equivalent amount. So by that's buying offsets. By so buying okay. offsets. And that, that is one way... Uh, of doing it. Ultimately, though, it's a good question. International law depends on people's willingness to honour their international obligations, and the consequences if they don't do that uh, are that they are treated with some suspicion next time they come to the negotiating table and they want to have something, and uh, you turn around and say, Well, hang on a minute, if you're not prepared to honour the agreements you've already made, uh, why should we take you seriously in these new negotiations? So uh, ultimately, uh, the system of international law does depend on good faith. Clearly, if there are serious breaches of international law, uh, ones which uh, can involve uh, the UN Security Council judging uh, that a country uh, actually has so seriously breached international law uh, that it can justify intervention by other countries, and that was the case, for example, uh, in Libya, uh, then there are extreme... Uh, Did you anticipate that at some point in the future, you know, 10 years from now, if uh, the, you know, the climate's uh, deteriorating and people aren't binding their equi uh, sorry, keeping their binding commitments, that the UN Security Council could be involved? I think it's... Um, I, I, I hope it's unlikely. Uh, and I hope that we get to a situation where uh, that doesn't occur. Uh, but I'm merely making the point... Uh, that we already have international legal mechanisms uh, in, by which we can enforce international law. And, of course, we have the International Criminal Court, and that also uh, deals with people who have committed crimes against humanity. So there is an increasing amount of international law which is important, respected, uh, and I think the more interdependent the world becomes, the more important it is that that international legal framework is respected. Okay. Well, thank you. I want to come to, uh, to our other panellists. I'll come to Tasneem first. So we co I covered a lot of ground there, but um, first of all, you know, uh, is, is the UK seen as a leader? How do people see things that have happened domestically? Uh, and then secondly, on, on sort of penalties or uh, how, how uh, these international binding agreements will be policed. What's your thoughts on those? Well, certainly we know that the UK at the domestic level has provided leadership. We do believe, however, that uh, this process in Durban requires the EU as a whole to provide leadership, and the UK can certainly play an important role in that. But in addition to that, the UK can do that by, in fact, not waiting for the the EU to take its 30% to move to 30% and already in the UK start taking on 30% as well. Um, we've seen Denmark do that quite um, uh, clearly and so that kind of leadership is useful in building the momentum and the trust and the confidence that developed countries are really taking responsibility and providing what was meant to be a leading role in cutting emissions. That kind of signal is very important for uh, the situation where we are expecting developing countries to also now commit themselves to legally binding agreements in the future. So certainly EU leadership and UK leadership within that is going to be important for momentum back here in Durban. Getting out of time, so I want to come to Hannah quickly and then we'll go to a final question. Last chance. Okay, Hannah, reflections on the UK's position and possibly on their penalties that might or might not apply to people who break agreements in the future. Sure. Um, well, I think, I think in many respects the UK is, is, is taking a leading position, but I've hinted tonight at the areas where I feel that the UK government could take more leadership. And of course, we would applaud you on your 0.7% commitment um, very much. So we'd like to see more in that vein. Um, I think in term, international law is, uh, uh, is, unfortunately, there are no really particularly effective enforcement mechanisms or compliance mechanisms. My understanding is that there is a compliance body or compliance mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol and I think in Cancun, Croatia uh, of all countries was, was brought in front of that but it's not something that's particularly public or that is that effective at holding people to account. So I think when it comes to international law, I mean organisations such as Oxfam see ourselves as very much 
publicly holding governments to account for the commitments that they've, um, they've made on a global level, given that, that there is an absence of a sort of global police force making sure that this happens. Yeah. Um, I think holding governments to account for the commitments that they have made, always calling them up on the commitments, making sure that they're not allowed to slip, Organisations like Oxfam and the general public are a crucial component of making sure that the global legally binding uh, okay. agreements are adhered to. Great. Well, uh, thanks. We're getting some more questions in now. So this will be the final one. I'm actually going to combine two just to uh, squeeze them in. So um, first of all, one from Adam that's just come in. Thanks for that. It says, uh, when do you think global emissions must peak and how will that be done if a treaty isn't in place? I guess that's alluding to uh, the, the idea that some people have that you can do it from sort of voluntary agreements. Um, and then one from uh, Sheik Rose, uh, which came in slightly earlier, um, which might give us an optimistic uh, answer or not, perhaps, depending, to finish on. It's, she um, asks, is it actually going to be possible to keep global temperatures to less than two degrees Celsius? So when, when should emissions peak? How are we going to do that without a treaty? And is it going to be possible to stay under 2C? There's your easy finishing question. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, good, good questions and, and, uh, and, and not that easy to answer. I mean, I personally think, that the, and the British government thinks, and the EU thinks, that legally binding treaties are the only way which we've ever tackled major international problems. If it was on chlorofluorocarbons, the Montreal Protocol, on international disarmament, I think the idea that we would have stopped the arms race in nuclear missiles through voluntary pledges seems to me to be uh, pretty far-fetched. So I think we need a legally binding framework. But it is true uh, that that is a necessary condition in my view, but not enough. If you look at the fact that Canada, for example, has been signed up to the Kyoto Protocol but is seriously breaching it, whereas actually the commitments that China is making through its five-year plan process uh, to reducing carbon intensity are not backed up uh, by legally binding commitments in Kyoto, but I think are strong and credible. Uh, so I think it's important to be strong and credible. That needs an international framework, an international uh, treat, legally binding uh, treaty, but it also needs serious buy-in domestically so that there's uh, delivery on the ground. The science is very clear. We have to get a peak of global emissions by 2020 and get them coming down if we are to stand a realistic chance of holding global warming to two degrees above pre-industrial levels. I think we still can. Uh, I'm an optimist, uh, but I think that time is running out, that there is very little time left for the world to step up to the plate and really deliver uh, on this. And that's why the deadlines that we're talking about are that we have to have a credible, strong, legally binding agreement by 2015. We have to have peaked emissions by 2020. And the whole process has to be subject to constant review from the ongoing scientific evidence. So if we subsequently need to tighten things up, move further and faster, or if by some a miracle we find we don't have to move so far and so fast, we respect the science. Because there's no point in politicians going to Durban and preaching a whole load of nonsense which isn't based on the facts of what we observe on the ground. That's but, key. Can I just clarify one thing, Chris? So you said, you know, very, you said very, very clearly we want a legally binding treaty by 2015. Now, as we know with uh, Kyoto, it took about five years to get that ratified. Eight which, years. Eight years, big pardon. Eight years. Um, yeah. take, which, which kind of takes you, in fact, that if it's eight years, it takes you beyond your 2020 yeah. point. So, I mean, how are you dealing with that well, possible I problem? Think, I think the ratification uh, issues uh, for Kyoto were really problematic. Uh, and they required a lot of uh, quite difficult uh, behind-the-scenes negotiations themselves, even after the negotiation. Uh, that was uh, exceptionally difficult. Most international treaties can be ratified much more quickly. And I think the realistic timetable, assuming goodwill and assuming that people actually want to tackle this problem, will be 2015 and 2020. And uh, that will give us enough margin to get through both the negotiations. So, just to be clear, you're saying it would be, it would be sort of fully ratified and in operation by 2020? 
fully ratified and actually biting on the problem okay. by 2020. Okay. And 2015, I think, realistically, yeah. given the timetables which can differ for ratification and in the Kyoto Protocol, was eight years yeah. from, from, from the, you know, actually getting the agreement to getting everything really done and dusted. I think that that's a, a timetable we have to respect. Okay, well, thank you very much. I do want to just give um, a last word to Hannah here. We have to be brief because we're almost out of time. And I want to finish in Durban uh, with uh, Taz Noon there. So um, just a final couple of reflections. Can we do it? Yeah, well, a, few, <laughs> a few reflections. I hope we can do it. And Oxfam would like to see a legally binding agreement as soon as possible. Um, we wouldn't say uh, 2015 is necessarily soon enough. So as soon as possible. And we want to see emissions coming down by 2020. Yes, ratification processes can be complicated, but it doesn't mean that countries can't start to act on their aspirations before that ratification process has started. So we'd like to see emissions coming down by then. Now, I'd like to say one final word, and that's always to remember in these conversations that if we don't act with the uh, necessary urgency, if we don't start to get emissions coming down by 20, uh, before 2020, it's the poorest and the most vulnerable globally who are going to suffer the most. And I think it's always important to remember that in these conversations that ultimately the poorest and most vulnerable globally should be who we're thinking about when we're around the negotiating table. Thank you Hannah. So finally to Tasneem in Durban. Are you optimistic? You're there in the heart of it at the moment. Obviously we'll uh, build up to the, the real hard negotiations next week. How are you feeling? Well, we'll remain optimistic uh, because there's the urgency of getting agreements each year to deal with this global crisis. And certainly we would want to see high levels of ambition. And we hope that the UK can provide leadership when the Secretary of State arrives here. We will certainly look forward to the kind of leadership he's demonstrated in this uh, discussion this evening. Uh, we will want to see emissions peak by 2015. The science is clear about this. And we do clearly see that by 2020 to get a ratifi ratified legal agreement is much too late. We would want to see an agreement by 2015 to be entered into force and ratified at least by 2018 for the latest. Certainly, we need to keep the ambition levels high. We need to send out a clear signal that leaders will act here in the interests of the globe, its people, and certainly the most vulnerable. Thank you very much. So, uh, final thank you very much indeed to Chris Hume, Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change. You'll be heading out to uh, Durban to represent the UK uh, on Sunday. Hard week ahead for him. Uh, Tasneem Essop from WWF already in Durban and here alongside me, uh, Hannah Stoddart from uh, Oxfam. Thank you to Stop uh, Climate Change Coalition for organising this. Uh, I've been Damien Carrington from The Guardian and good night.